Hello everyone, my name is Pixelriffs and welcome back to the Hardcore Survival Guide. Today we build a house. And yes, I know in episode 1 I said we don't need to build a shelter, and technically we don't. A lot of people play Minecraft without really establishing a solid base. But we're not after shelter, we are after comfort. And what says comfort better than a hobbit hole? Before we can do that though, we need to gather some supplies, and I'll explain why in a minute. But first of all, I need to sort out what earth is going on up here, because apparently there are zombies in the roof of my blacksmith. Yeah, I have limited enough experiences with Plains Biome Houses to understand that this was apparently a spawnable space the entire time. Thank you to everybody in the comments who has pointed that out. It was going to drive me crazy, especially with two zombies up there now. Before we leave, we're going to take the coordinates of this village because I think I have them written down somewhere, but I don't know exactly where. So having a fresh screenshot of that is going to be super helpful. And we're going to go east, back towards the swamp, because I'm fairly certain I saw a large body of water in this direction, and I'm hoping that the swamp will lead out to the ocean somewhere. And apparently Apparently it doesn't, so change of plans, we're going over land for a little bit, but our main goal is to find an ocean so we can go searching for shipwrecks. Whoa, that's a cool cave. Cool cave right on the edge of a dark oak forest. Very nice. Okay, now you're talking. As soon as you can start to see kelp floating on the surface of the water, now you know we're getting somewhere. So I'm going to head out in search of a shipwreck, and there is even... A little axolotl floating in the water. How delightful. I love the ones with the purple colouring. They are my favourite. So we're going to row out to sea here in search of a shipwreck. It's usually nice and easy to find a shipwreck from the surface. A lot of the time you just got to look at the horizon and watch the stuff that loads in. And if anything kind of looks like the hull of a ship, then row towards it and check if it's a shipwreck. <laughs> that has actually gotten slightly harder in 1.17 because now geodes will spawn on the ocean floor. And a lot of the time, the curvature of these geodes makes them look a bit like shipwrecks to me. This looks promising though. That is quite a large shipwreck. Is it on its side or upside down? Kind of difficult to tell. Okay, so number one rule of raiding a shipwreck is to either look for a door in the shipwreck or bring enough wood that you can craft yourself a door. Because nobody likes drowning and the ocean is the best place to do it. By the way, if you want a place to place blocks in the ocean, look for the tallest piece of kelp and place a block on top of that. So we're going to head on down here and we're going to place a door, which on Java edition only, I don't think this works in Bedrock edition anymore, will create an air pocket. And the air pocket is something that you can stand in, albeit not really see a whole lot inside of here. Going to have to crank my brightness so that you guys can see what's going on. And from this, we can explore these chests and immediately we found what we want. I was looking for moss blocks in this shipwreck because that's the only way to get hold of them in Minecraft 1.17. Later, of course, they'll generate in lush caves, but for now, we can only get them from shipwrecks. So that was a lucky find. We also got some bamboo without even needing to find a jungle. So shipwrecks kind of OP in 1.17. Naturally, that's not the only chest the shipwreck has. So we're going to carve our way through here, place a door in that spot there so that we can get our breath back, open this up and grab the buried treasure map. Oh, there's also plenty of paper and books. All right, I'll take those with me as well. There are a few different configurations of shipwrecks and one this large should have a third chest if we swim through to the top part here. And that one's usually got a bunch of iron and emeralds and gold and a few like more treasure items in it. Occasionally you'll find some diamonds, but I think that's pretty rare. And in this case, we got a bottle of enchanting. You'll have to forgive my curiosity if I get sidetracked in this world occasionally, but a new world is always fun for new opportunities to explore so I'm going to take advantage of that at every turn. One thing I'm also going to do is grab my buried treasure map here, and I guess we're going to row back towards this island? Nope, actually completely the opposite way. I think our treasure is buried around the other side of this island. And it looks like we're going to get a bit of interference from the land here, but if I place a couple of torches down, we'll at least have a better idea of what is out there. So where we're at right now is probably within the same chunk as the treasure is buried. We want to press F3 and look for the chunk coordinates that line up with nine and then a number in the middle and then nine. The number in the middle is probably 14 or 15 if you're on the surface. All we need to do is line ourselves up with the block on that nine, nine chunk coordinate, dig straight down and we should find the treasure chest. Perfect. What have we got in here? Three diamonds. Very nice. We're very good at finding three diamonds in this series, apparently. Let's chuck out some of this other stuff, gather the TNT, and swim back up to the surface before we drown. So from that, we also got a Heart of the Sea, which with eight Nautilus shells will make a conduit that can allow us to breathe underwater indefinitely. That's going to be super useful for some of the stuff we're going to do in future, including probably this ocean monument over here. I expect we'll do something with that a little bit later, maybe a guardian farm of some kind for Prismarine. I don't know. I'm not sure how far we'll get with the technical project in this series, but we got six months, so I'm looking forward to it. But anyway, we got the moss blocks. The moss blocks are what we came here for, and on the voyage back, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the process I go through when building. 
So people often ask me where I get inspiration from for builds and how I come up with a lot of the stuff I build, and that approach has varied over the years, but lately the answer has primarily been Google image search. Now, a lot of the time I recommend getting reference images for a build. In this case, the Hobbit hole, there's a ton of images online and there are even some from Minecraft, but if we don't want to copy those whole cloth, I'm just going to find an image that I like. I really liked this one down here that appeared on a Reddit thread, so I'm just going to pop that on screen. I'll leave a credit for that in the video description and we're going to use this as the reference image, go into a creative test world and try out building this hobbit hole, or close enough, a Minecraft interpretation of this hobbit hole anyway. Now if you're one of those people who prefers to build whatever you want to build in survival without using creative mode to try stuff out beforehand, that's fine, but personally I think that 90% of the time my builds have been better when I've drafted them in creative first, and I usually set up a super flat world with a ton of layers of dirt so that there's a little bit of room to build below the build instead of just on the surface, and realistically it's going to take you much less time to come up with something in creative and then copy it into survival than it is to come up with stuff in survival and do all of the trial and error of building with different materials and testing stuff with survival physics, with gravity, without being able to fly around and pull materials out of your inventory as often as you want. So with the image of the hobbit hole pulled up on my second monitor, I try and emulate exactly what jumps out at me about the picture. In this case, it's going to be the door, because the door is such a bright colour and it's got this beautiful brick frame surrounding it, and so the first thing I do is try and build something approximating that circle out of brick blocks. But it doesn't quite feel right, there's something a little artificial about it, it's not going to look as nice as the frame made of bricks, and so what I end up doing is a bit more of an interpretation of this, we start to shallow the circle out using slabs instead of full blocks, and I play around a little bit until I've got a shape that I think I'm happy with. I also decide to put the door at ground level so it's a little bit easier to walk in, but what we end up with is this kind of oval shape, which I think looks really nice. I then move on to deciding what materials I want to use for the door itself. My first thought, of course, is warped planks, because they have that kind of natural wood grain to them, and of course they are a pretty similar colour than the hobbit hole door in this picture. But something about that doesn't quite feel right either. The grain of the planks is the wrong way, it needs to be vertical rather than horizontal, and honestly it feels a little little bit dark and contrasty and at odds with the brick texture around it. So I go with something a bit more simple and we go with stripped warped stem because that feels a little bit lighter and doesn't have as much texture which means the brick around it can really start to stand out. Instantly that feels much better, and I even decide to add a button in the center as the door knocker. That could even be a mechanism that we use to open the door a little bit later on. But now I think about using this as an actual door, and I figure where am I going to put a door in this. I kind of don't know if a warped door is going to make sense there, and yeah, it looks completely out of place, so I decide against that, and instead we're probably going to work with the fact that the door in the picture is slightly ajar, so maybe I can remodel the door slightly so it opens inward and give myself enough room to sneak into this build by stepping around the door frame. That seems good, so I start working out what material I want to use for the walls surrounding them, and eventually I settle on sandstone. Smooth sandstone has a nice neutral texture to it so it's not going to contrast too heavily with anything, and it also has slabs and stairs available for it, meaning we can shape out the windows this way. The brick frames just aren't going to work, that's too small of a detail for the brick blocks that we have available to us, so sandstone is probably the way to go here, with some framing elements around it using spruce fences and a canopy over the top with dark oak. Already this is starting to look like my interpretation of a hobbit hole rather than the exact hobbit hole in the picture. The wood accents are different, there's just a, a slightly different vibe about it, and we can't fit in as much detail because it's Minecraft and we're dealing with blocks and half blocks and so forth. But it's really when we get the moss roof in that things start to take shape. Naturally, the moss isn't going to be able to have the fluff that the roof on the hobbit hole has, and while I'm trying to work out the lines between the house and the moss layer, I realise that obviously it's going to have to drape full forward a little bit and come down over the front of the build, so I start mixing in layers of moss with some azalea leaves and the whole thing really starts to come alive after that. Now that I'm happy with the materials, I start working on the rest of the facade, and it really is just a facade. The hobbit hole is going to be buried in a hill, so the front is all that matters. The shape of the rest of the structure doesn't need to be planned in advance, it's just going to be a tunnel into the hill from there on out. And so by copying those features over to the opposite side, we end up with a really nice, kind of symmetrical, but kind of organic feeling build. This explosion of foliage on the right hand side can just be represented by this wall of moss, and that'll also help us blend it into the space we've got in the hardcore survival guide world. 
A couple of window details go in, overlapping the crisscross frames of tinted glass with a couple of fences on the front to add some different lines to it. And on a whim, I decide to set up a redstone mechanism that pulls a section of the door aside when you press that door knocker button. Just using a redstone torch, a couple of blocks and some redstone dust, this simply pulls the blocks aside for a second, allowing me to pass through. But more importantly, it allows me to create the illusion of depth by painting around the outside of the door with black terracotta, making it seem like there is a shadow there when actually the door isn't even open. So I'll tinker with a few more details, but as long as I'm fairly happy with the build as it stands, I'll just take a few screenshots so that I can have those up on my second monitor when I rebuild it in survival, and I go back to the hardcore world to start collecting materials. So now back in survival we have something of a shopping list because that needed bricks, it needed terracotta and it needed some stripped warped wood which means we're going to have to go to a swamp and then the nether which is kind of a, a, a tricky consideration right now but let's face it we're as geared up as we're going to be. We've got full diamond armor, we've got a shield, we've got full diamond tools and I think we've got a reasonable foundation here that we can move to getting into the nether and a little bit more progression on that side of things. First of all though, to the swamp. I think the swamp is going to be the less dangerous prospect of the two. The swamp is going to provide some nice easy surface level clay and we can always reform all of this back into clay blocks to smelt in a furnace so that we can turn it into terracotta. And then the black dye should be easy enough if we see a squid anywhere in the next little while. Like this one in the river. So in a regular furnace we're going to get some of those smelting and we're going to smelt up the clay balls into bricks. We could trade with a stonemason for those but to be honest it's not really a huge concern right now. All we need is a few blocks of bricks and honestly the swamp has provided. And while the rest of that stuff is cooking, we're going to go to the nether. The first trick, of course, being that we need to make sure we've got some gold armor on, otherwise we will be killed by the locals who prefer you to wear gold armor. So I'm going to leave my diamond helmet in here. Hopefully we'll be able to return for that. And with a gold helmet on, it's time to go and find a surface lava lake. Well, as it turns out, the nearest lava lake I could find was actually miles away. We're not too close to the spawn point here. I think we're basically like, what is this direction? West. We're west of the village. And I found a lava lake out here in the tiger biome, which is good because honestly, I didn't want to come out of the nether at the village to find out that it was night and there were going to be zombies around who might harm the villagers. But what we need to do here is clear out a little bit of space by this lava lake because we're going to do the bucket method that you've probably seen speedrunners use if you watch speedruns of creating a nether portal quickly. Now I'm pretty sure we need to start with a relatively flat area because we need to place a block there and we need to put our water bucket right there to create two blocks of obsidian at an angle like this. Once we remove that, we create two blocks of obsidian behind that and that creates the pillars basically for our nether portal. We're going to be digging out these two blocks here, but we add lava into these two spaces that I've just dug out and it converts directly into obsidian because the water's still on top of it. Next up, we pillar up three blocks and then place a block adjacent to it like that over the top of this pillar of the portal. We need to dig out the two blocks behind where we're going to be placing the water and we're going to place one block here basically right in front of this pillar. We're also going to place one there because we basically want to stop the water from overflowing into the pool where the lava sources are. Now we're going to place a block here so that the water flows down over it and we can start building the portal. So we're going to be placing the water bucket against that pillar there and from there we can essentially build a portal frame by picking up lava sources directly from the lava lake and placing them in the portal formation. The water will automatically convert them into obsidian and when we're done we have a complete nether portal frame albeit in a slightly precarious position surrounded by all this lava. I am once again gonna skip the night so that we don't have to worry too much about mobs right here and now we need to have a way of lighting the portal. I haven't brought a flint and steel with me but there are a couple of other ways you can do this especially considering that there are lava sources nearby so I'm gonna try and do this with the plank method basically we're going to dump the water source over here somewhere and pick up this lava source on the corner to have it sat next to these planks and when the planks end up catching on fire hopefully a fire will light inside the frame of the portal and it's going to light the nether portal for us. This might take a minute or two so we could always look around and make a couple of preparations, grab some food, grab any more blocks that we want to take to the nether with us and we just got to wait for these planks to catch fire. Of course, if you're playing in a world that has fire spread turned off, then that's not going to be of any use to you. But in hardcore, if we haven't changed any of the game rules, fire spread should still be on. And I'm kind of surprised that none of this spruce forest has started burning down yet. Honestly, in a default vanilla world, the time it's going to take for this method to work, you could probably just go and get the ingredients for a flint and steel. So that's what I'm going to do, but we'll see if the portal's lit when I get back. 
Nope, still no portal yet. In fact, the lava has just burned through one of the planks and flooded the portal frame entirely. So, so much for that method. But in the meantime, I've got myself some raw iron. So I can just smelt that into an iron ingot. We can craft a flint and steel. And I'm just going to light the portal the regular way. <laughs> I'm going to take this bucket of lava off my hotbar because I don't want to reflexively try and use it when we're in the nether. And let's step on through and hope we're in a warp forest. Nope, looks like we are in a ravine in a nether wastes biome right on the border of a crimson forest. Or we might even be in... Yeah, we are in a crimson forest. The particles kind of gave that away. We're just in a weird ravine of one, and it looks like we're going to have to do some climbing before we can get out of here, which is good. Luckily, the blocks around here are malleable enough that we shouldn't have any real trouble as long as we don't mine any gold ore, because then the local piglins might take exception to that. Looks like we're also coming out on a soul sand valley, so I'm going to grab a little bit of the bone structure that's around here, but then probably leave before we encounter any ghasts, because I don't really feel like running into them right now. Since I think I saw the Crimson Forest continue in this direction, what I'm trying to do here is tunnel through to what I think will be the other side of this landmass. I don't mind fortuning some quartz along the way. Once again, as long as we don't break gold ore, we'll be fine. And we're out the other side into the Crimson Forest. Okay, perfect. So let's grab a warped fungus from around here. These are honestly your best defense against hoglins if you're not comfortable fighting one. You just got to place down the warped fungus on any nearby piece of nylium. You won't be able to place it on netherrack, but you can place it on nylium. Stand within its radius and hoglins will run away from you instead of attacking you. Unfortunately, for me, you cannot grow warped trees on crimson nylium, which means we can't just start farming warped wood here and now. We will have to find a warped forest and either bring home some nylium or bring home some wood if we want to build with it. And honestly, I should be marking my route here. Even though I've learned to navigate by landmarks in the nether, it's usually a good idea to mark your route. So what we're going to do is build the scumpus. This is two blocks of cobblestone with a torch pointing back in the direction of your nether portal. Should be nice and easy to spot from a distance because nothing else in the nether is really that color aside from gravel. And hopefully we can get a bead on a warped forest here. For now, rule number one is to not bridge out over a lava lake unless the objective is too good to pass up and we have some means of escape or unless we want to risk digging up some gold from the nearby landscape and trading it with the piglins for potentially getting a fire resistance potion because that's going to allow us to at least take a brief dip in lava and come away unscathed. Honestly the nether landscape here is not looking very hospitable at all so I'm probably going to try going the other direction from my nether portal spawn location. I'm going to see if we can branch out the opposite way and maybe we'll be able to find a warped forest that way. Once again, keeping the warped fungus on our hotbar in case we encounter any hoglins and keeping an eye if there are any warped fungus in the landscape nearby as well because we can sort of use those as way stations to get from point to point without the hoglins bothering us. Man, a disappointing amount of the nether terrain around here is pretty much impassable. So I think our best bet might actually be going out over the Soul Sand Valley. At least we're getting our fair share of bones from these skeletons as well, but Soul Sand Valleys are gonna have increased chance of skeleton and ghast spawns. And speaking of which, we've got a hoglin and a ghast on us right now. This is not a great situation to be in. Well, for a hardcore world, that got pretty chaotic there, but we only lost half a heart and I've got plenty of food on me. Plus, I think the Hoglin may have dropped a couple of pork chops for us, so that's not too bad. And here's a nice easy return to sender advancement. There we go. Yeah, honestly, the best way to get return to sender is to do it with a bow and shoot the ghast right as it's about to shoot you because then your arrow will just repel its own fireball directly into its face at point blank range. You really can't miss. Well, we've tried north, south and west. Now I'm going to try east. And if we dig through the landscape of the nether here, hopefully we should come out somewhere a little bit higher than that lava lake we saw. Oh, well, that's a nice surprise. On our way east, we've actually stumbled upon a piece of ancient debris. So that's going to be our first <laughs> our first ancient debris, which is not something I was expecting to get today, but there you go. All I wanted was a starter house. Okay, this is unbelievable. We've now found every biome in the nether except for the warp forest. <laughs> this nether is cursed. This is not a good situation to be in. I've traveled quite far through a crimson forest to be here and... All I've found is basalt delta, nether wastes, and more crimson forest. 
Well, I know what I'm going to do here, and that is check this ruined portal for loot. I imagine we'll be okay as long as there aren't any regular piglins around, and right now the zombie piglins seem to be keeping most of them at bay, so okay, regular golden apple. Okay, well that's not too bad, but nothing else in there was really worth having. And now I found a bastion! <laughs> I'm finding all of the stuff I'm not looking for, with the exception, I suppose, of a nether fortress, but I... Honestly think it's about time we turned around and headed home because I'm not finding a warp forest The entire nether seems to be full of everything but warp forest. We're gonna make our hobbits door a different color Yep entirely terrible idea made my way back to the nether portal though. So there's that let's see what the weather's looking like oh, Of course, it's raining <laughs> Well, uh, the rest of my iron is finishing smelting up in here So at least we survived our trip through the nether so there's that I'm gonna head back to the village We're gonna consider our options for what else to build the hobbits front door out of but we're gonna get this hobbit house built in this episode because frankly I just want to do it now. Yeah, let's look on the bright side here We came back from the nether we brought two ancient debris with us We got a whole heap of bone blocks that we could use for bone meal We got a free golden apple out of the deal and ultimately we didn't die So I think that went pretty well I could have used the spyglass to look at a ghast while I was there apparently that's an advancement now But we don't need to worry too much about that We're here to build a hobbit hole and I think what we're going to do is go ahead and build it out of stripped oak wood instead of stripped warped wood for now and maybe we can replace the door or build another door or build another hobbit hole entirely somewhere else but for now I want to make this house a reality. The other thing we need to get, aside from the bricks that are still smelting in the furnace, is a bunch of sandstone. And I'm probably going to gather a bit of sandstone from a nearby beach. Maybe we'll go back to that ocean biome and grab some sand from there and craft it into sandstone. But either way, that seems to be the only thing standing in our way right now. Okay, I got a bunch of sand from beaches and river biomes, crafted it into some sandstone. We're keeping a little bit of as regular sand for texture. And I'm just going to grow a couple of dark oak wood trees so we have enough wood to do the kind of canopy out the front. And the last preparation we really need to make is to grow some moss. Moss is really easy to grow, you just need to get rid of any foliage in the surroundings because moss won't grow onto a block that has already got some grass growing on it. So we clear out a little space here, we're just going to dig a hole in the ground, plant a moss block in there, and just bone meal that. And that will start to grow the moss in place of the grass. You can also do this with stone if you want to, but I like doing it on grass just so we can kind of clear out a little area up here. Now from that we're also getting moss carpet blocks and azalea saplings or azalea bushes I guess. Uh, these are going to be used to grow some trees in just a second because we need those for the leaves. You can plant the azalea on any kind of surface, just got to bone meal it a couple of times to grow it into a tree. It gives you oak wood but it also gives you rooted dirt underneath which is kind of nice and most importantly for us it gives us the leaves and the flowering leaves which I'm going to gather with some shears. Or am I going to enchant this hoe with silk touch? Dang it. Okay, now we're ready to start the build. Let's clear out the rest of the grass in this area. I'm probably doing this with a water bucket, but my water bucket is now a lava bucket. And let's use the stone cutter to turn all our bricks here into slabs, because we're not using stairs at all, and slabs won't lose you any materials. They're basically just going to be half blocks that we build with the whole time. And I think we're going to build the front door, let's say about here. It's going to stick out from the hillside enough that we can cover the top of it with moss, and it will be pretty obvious that somebody lives here. And having smelted some sandstone down into smooth sandstone, we're going to turn four of that into stairs and get started on this window on the right hand side. I guess we're gonna do this one level with the house like we did in the creative build. We need a little bit of a wall there and we need to leave a gap on this side like so before we end up covering over the window like that. Perfect. Okay, we need to get some tinted glass, but I did craft some of that in the last episode, so we should have some of that handy. I'm going to put the front door in now, just so the whole thing looks a little bit better in the meantime. This section here is where it starts to curve back on itself. And bam, there we go. Not too shabby. I think we're going to add, decorate this with some trap doors, just to give it a little bit more character, and that's going to distract from the fact that it's basically just an oak door now. The shadow of the door can just hang out at the back here. That looks about right to me. We'll put the redstone in a little bit later. And We'll add a little bit of texture to these walls with the sand blocks. I think those are actually going to look really nice in there. If you're wondering why I'm not doing this as a time lapse, it's because that involves opening the world to the local area network, which is also how you can enable cheats in a world. And I kind of don't want to do that because look, it's kind of proof that we've done all of this legit. Fences on the front of there, that starts to provide the platform for the dark oak planks on the top, and then the moss canopy can come down over that. 
I had to move the shadow of the door one block further in because of course we need to have a sandstone wall in here and that's where our second window is going to go. It tucks really nicely into the hillside here though and with the moss draping down over the sides I think this is going to look lovely. I'll put a dark oak button in the center there for lack of a better wood to use and honestly this ain't looking too bad so far. It needs to get some foliage around it though. So down here by the front door we're going to add a few little azalea bushes, mix in some of the leaves here and there and if you ignore the enchanting station and the build chest in the way right now just that change alone makes this look really really nice i love the fact that the azalea bushes are so bright and they have those lovely pink flowers we haven't even put the moss roof on yet and already this is starting to feel very cozy we're going to hang the lanterns from these fence posts one here one here and one here we might have to do a little bit more lighting around the perimeter don't want any creepers spawning outside my front door but now it's time for the moss roof we're going to lay down mostly moss here i do have a little bit more dark oak wood over the top there but then we can just fill the top part of this all the way to the front with moss and then we'll start to swap in the azalea leaves as we get a bit further back here we want to have the azalea leaves hanging down over the front of the porch like so a little bit of moss can hang down there as well oh yeah no that's a treat that's an absolute treat i like it even with the oak door <laughs> the compromise oak door i love that that's really nice looking we can cover up bits of the hill with the moss on this side throw in a few more azalea leaves there and after a little bit more shaping of the roof, I think that looks absolutely lovely. We're going to throw a little bit more bone meal onto the roof moss there to make it grow up a little bit of grass. But I'll try not to grow too much tall grass or azalea on there because I really don't know if I want those. Well, folks, I think the hobbit hole is all blended in here. We're probably going to grow a big tree on top of that at some point. But honestly, just look at this place. I really, really like this. I need to make sure that the enchanting setup and everything is all packed away. But we do need to make sure that we have our our front door set up as well and I'm still not sure how we're going to get out of it but we'll figure that out another time maybe we'll have a side entrance that we can use but for the main entrance for our guests of course we will need to have some way of them getting in and all we should need is a few redstone dust so we can make a redstone torch and I guess we're making some sticky pistons for now we need to make two pistons and we need to get hold of some slime now the swamp over in that direction would be the best place to do that but we do have to do that at night in the meantime we've got the opportunity to do a little bit of gardening we can make some sort of garden path here maybe combine dirt and gravel to get some coarse dirt and I think out the front here I want to have some kind of post box there's this sort of like I don't know maybe it's like a little bird coop or something in the reference image so I think we should have something on a stick there and I I honestly really want it to be a beehive not a bee nest like this but a bee hive but I think I have two honeycomb where I do need three for that so we'll have to maybe put that together another time and the best part about building into a hillside like this is that basically your space is unlimited you can sort of just dig into the hillside and put whatever you like in here and a lot of people like building cave bases personally i've never quite been a fan of the cave base approach but something tells me in the next update that's going to change and it looks like night is falling outside so now is the time for us to leap into action and go and find a slime in the swamp unfortunately for me the new moon is rising and slimes are actually more plentiful at a full moon so we might not find too much slime here but good news is we only need two slime balls at a time so fingers crossed we'll be able to find one nice and quickly this is probably the longest i've spent at night during this entire series don't worry that's not a huge ravine <laughs> and honestly the swamps around here are kind of small which presents a bit of a problem because there's not really a huge enough area for a large amount of mobs to spawn in a swamp like a lot of the mob cap is being taken up by mobs in the neighboring plains biome and so i don't think there's a huge amount of area that slimes can spawn here added to that fact the swamp around here doesn't really seem to be all that big there's a little patch of it here a little patch of it over there and then a lot of it is water and water is not really a great place for slimes to spawn so i'm not really seeing any slime spawns at all tonight because unfortunately the mob cap is taken up by other mobs in the surrounding biomes oh oh i see one it's the next night and i see one finally a giant slime bouncing beneath the trees let's see if we can get up into this tree you can just climb vines by jumping at them at this point uh yep i think we're going to be able to take this guy down no problem it's a pretty big target let's be real 
And the good news is, small slimes, even on hard mode, you can run right up to them and they can't even do damage to you, especially if you're wearing armor of this quality. So there we go, there's our few slime balls. We can take out the rest of these just in case we need some more for sticky pistons and I think that calls it good for tonight. I need to get some sleep and we need to make ourselves those sticky pistons for the front door. There we go, home sweet home. I've already started to make a couple of renovations. We're starting to put in a floor. I'll be working on a whole bunch of this later but for now we can put the two sticky pistons in place we can pop down these two strip logs back where they were and now if we press the button we'll be able to walk on into our home and the door closes behind us now how we open that door again is probably going to be break it with an axe for the moment but in the meantime i love the fact that we have a redstone door for our hobbit hole and most importantly it means the villagers can't come a knocking unless they are invited well thank you so much for watching this episode of the hardcore survival guide i think we are going to leave it there and i'm so happy that our starter house has taken shape. My name has been Pixorifs. Don't forget to leave a like on this episode if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you guys soon. Take care. Bye for now.